This episode is brought to you by Polestar, a car brand designing a future that's 100% electric. Polestar is saying no for all the right reasons. No empty promises, because Polestar turns visions into reality. No greenwashing, because their words are set in stone. No conquering Mars, because Earth is their priority. No compromises, because the planet deserves real action. Get the full story and explore the Polestar 2 at polestar.com. This is the Marketing Podcast Network. Want Instagrammers and YouTubers to mention your brand? Or do you want to influence an audience to buy your product? I'm Jason Falls, author of the book, Winfluence, reframing influencer marketing to ignite your brand. In this podcast, we explore the people, companies, campaigns, and stories that illustrate the difference between using influencers and actually influencing. Welcome to Winfluence, the influence marketing podcast. Hello again, friends. Thanks for listening to Winfluence, the Influence Marketing Podcast. You can't be involved in the influencer marketing space without hearing about, talking about, or considering the influencer pay gap. When the topic first emerged, it referred to the disparity in pay between men and women who are content creators. Quickly, however, the influencer pay gap issue focused on the gap between white and non-white or BIPOC creators as well. For a while, in early 2021, it was almost all we talked about. Mind you, I'm not complaining. We were right to talk about it, and talk about it a lot. The more equitable and fair pricing and payment can be across influencer categories, the better. And it appears our conversations are having a positive impact on the gap. It's shrinking. New data out from ISEA, which has been tracking pay disparity among influencers since 2015, shows another year of progress in closing the gaps, with some good and some bad news. But when you look further at the data, more questions than answers emerge. It's not time to celebrate yet. It's time to start asking deeper questions about the data, so we're not looking at false positives and missing hidden problems. I'll dig into it and explain in today's commentary. Before I do, let's take a moment to learn a little something from a customer of our presenting sponsor, Tagger. It is a complete influencer marketing software suite that allows you to find, connect, and collaborate with influencers, execute campaigns, and measure success. But as you know, I like to chat with Tagger customers rather than just drop an ad here. I think it's far more useful for you to hear what they've learned and what they're using the platform for. TJ Ferreira is one of those customers. He's the co-founder of Bubs Naturals, a health and wellness family of products. I spoke to him recently about how he uses Tagger. What do you like most about the information you can get out of that, about your, your p- prospective influencers? Aside from the vanity metrics of the follower account and stuff like that, it gives engagement and demographic info. And the engagement and demo info is really important, obviously, to make sure that we do have overlap with our existing business unit and our existing marketing strategy and everything like that. So again, beyond just the the initial high level that most people I think are typically used to um, in terms of, you know, open up an Instagram profile and you just look and you say, oh, they have 3000 likes and they have 100,000 followers. Like, is that good engagement? It could be, but more consistently, it helps you look at a macro picture across their entire account, across, you know, a month's worth of posts, et cetera, that allows you to aggregate rather than the initial spot check, which I think allowed a lot of companies to fall into traps earlier on in the influencer game of just say we spot check a you know we spot check the last three posts and they all look good well some of those engagements could have been bought it could have been branded content there could have been something on the back end that you don't know about so do you have more of a macro picture and can you make an educated decision off that macro picture and that's really you know what we're what we're leveraging it for Thanks to TJ and Bubs Naturals for sharing their use of Tagger. To learn more and get a demo to see if Tagger is right for you, just visit jason.online slash Tagger today. That's jason.online slash Tagger. We are closing the influencer pay gap, but do any of us really pay attention to the numbers and what they might also mean? That's next on Winfluence. This episode is brought to you by Cox Home Life. Cox helps make your home smarter. And now you can see what's happening around your home right from your couch. Just pull up your home life cameras on your TV with your contour voice remote and some simple voice commands. Need to keep an eye on the kids when they're outside? Say, show me my backyard camera. And to see who's at the door, just say, show me my front porch camera. To learn more, visit cox.com slash this is home.
The big headline from Isaiah's 2022 State of Influencer Equality Report, which you can download for free at Isaiah.com, is that we continue to make progress at closing the influencer pay gap based on race. But 2021 saw the trend of closing the gender pay gap reverse and widen a bit. On the surface, you'd think that's good news and bad news. And in general, you're right. But even I, who think and talk about influencer marketing every day, don't always dig deeper into the numbers and make sure we fully understand the data and what it means. So let's attack the bad news first. In 2021, male influencers made 30% more than their female counterparts. The number in 2020 was 24%, so the gap widened by 6%. However, in 2019, it was at 47%. So the gap was cut in half two years ago and then grew by about a fourth last year. It's easy to look at that and think we're heading in the wrong direction, but one chart and graph or one data point does not a full picture make. Consider this. Women comprise 83% of all sponsored transactions in influencer marketing. There are four female influencers for every one male influencer monetizing their content. We cannot look at the gender pay gap, or the race pay gap for that matter, and not also consider economics, not just finances. There are factors at play here that go far beyond the average cost per post or a brand's influencer budget. Now, I don't report to have any credentials that qualify me as an economist. Listening to the Freakonomics podcast regularly is about as close as I get. But I do know that when we talk about influencer marketing, We're talking about a marketplace where goods and services are exchanged. Gender and race aren't the only factors that explain changes in that market. When you see that men made on average about $700 more for a sponsored post in 2021 than women, you may get angry, particularly if you're a woman. But if you then do the math and see that for every $1 million made by women influencers last year, men made a little over $250,000. $250,000. Well, it at least softens the blow, right? Women out earn men in total and buy a lot. That doesn't mean there isn't a pay gap or that we shouldn't be concerned. But let's look at the other factors that might inform the change. In 2021, men comprised 15% of all sponsored content. The unspecified gendered influencers account for the other 2% if you're doing the math. The 15% for men was an all-time high percentage for the guys, so more male influencers monetized their content last year. Now let's talk about supply and demand. If I'm putting together an influencer campaign and my brand is not gender-specific, so I don't sell women's clothing, I sell clothing for any gender. If four out of every five influencers is a woman, then I have a supply issue for the men. When the supply is low you pay more for the goods or services. I'm not saying men deserve to be paid more or less for influencer content. I'm simply saying that market conditions have created an environment that may explain why the numbers are what they are. Until we see more of a 50-50 split between the total number of creators, or even just getting to 70-30, you can expect the male-female pay gap to remain. And I would argue that it may not be the result of patriarchy or sexism. It may just be economics. Again, patriarchy, like institutional racism, creates conditions within the economics that makes the market inherently unfair. I understand that. And I hope we all continue to work to ensure those two market conditions in particular are eradicated for good. But blaming all of the pay gap issues on them is misleading. I want us to think about the data here holistically. On the race side of things, would you believe that in 2021, white creators were actually almost the lowest paid on average? Whites earned an average of $2,169 per post last year. Hispanics earned an average of $30 less than that. Statistically speaking, that's marginally less. African Americans in 2021 on average were paid almost $500 more per post than their white counterparts. Those creators in the non-white or other category of race earned over $600 more than white influencers. And the big jump here last year came from those identifying as Asian. They were paid an average of $2,972 per post last year, 
That's an 88% jump from their numbers in 2020. Now, digging into the data a bit more, you also see a huge jump in the average cost per paid post from those who speak Arabic. The increase went from $1,161 per post to $8,462. Now, for someone who sees a lot of data and research, this throws up a huge red flag for me. That is simply not a normal statistical progression. You can't explain it by some political or world event that would push a huge swell in the number of Arabic-speaking influencers into the marketplace. Had, say, Iran, Iraq, Syria, and Afghanistan all been liberated and infrastructure set up to put millions of those countries' people online, you could explain it. Now, maybe Isaiah made a big influencer recruiting push in the Arab world or with those of Arab descent. The data here is pulled from Isaiah's marketplace of influencers. Another explanation might be that Isaiah actively recruited and sold more brand deals with companies that market to consumers in the Arab world or of Arab descent, thus putting more emphasis on that type of influencer among its customers. Still, though, going from $1,100 to $8,400 in a year? Something's up. And that would likely be the impact that pushed Asian influencers from third to first by a long shot in the average of cost per post. Let's not get too distracted by that problem with the data, though, because the pay gap between white and BIPOC influencers is actually the opposite of what you would expect. Whites are paid less than most races. However, white influencers make up 57% of the total marketplace. So, like women on the gender side of the aisle, there are more white influencers. The supply and demand factors apply here, too. With fewer non-white races in the market, they can command higher fees. That doesn't mean they don't deserve higher fees. It doesn't mean they deserve less. It does mean that economic factors shouldn't trump factors of race or racism all of the time. Incidentally, 2021 was the first year since Isaiah has been measuring this that the number of white influencers actually aligned with the number of white people in the United States population. America is 58% white. This is another bit of data on the good news side of the aisle. Equitable does not mean there are more non-white influencers than white ones. Equitable means the percentages align with the U.S. population, at least in terms of demographic makeup. The money is a whole different story. The truth is, women make far higher total numbers of dollars than men in the industry. Whites make far higher total numbers of dollars than BIPOC creators. There is a gap on the gender side, but not as much of one on the race side. And over time, the numbers are looking more and more like what an equitable and fair society would like to see. Will they ever be perfect? Probably not. But are we making progress? It sure seems so and that's something to be happy with. However, it would be fair to note that this is just Isaiah's creator marketplace. Does it differ from the norm? Well, there's no real way to know. Isaiah doesn't disclose the total numbers of people in their marketplace, nor the total numbers of each demographic, at least not that I can find. I'm sure it's more than a small sample, though, so it is significant. While they do include the racial breakdown of the U.S. population as a benchmark in the report, There's no reason to believe the data they present is weighed to be a statistically representative sample when compared to census data. If it was, it would be a bit more significant. But more important to note is that Isaiah's creator marketplace attracts or includes a certain type or types of influencers. It doesn't include all content creators. Isaiah's managed services typically look for creators that have high follower counts, that participate in brand deals, and are generally consumer product focused. Their approach is typically to take influencer content and put a lot of paid spend behind it to meet certain goals for impressions or engagements. Isaiah's marketplace is both opt-in and publicly scraped data, so they can claim a good number of all types of influencers. But Isaiah is also not known for B2B influencers, so there are some gaps. But the data is still far more than a couple hundred survey results. It's hundreds, if not thousands, of influencers with paid or sponsored content. The report may not be exactly representative of the entire industry, but it's certainly informed enough to give us a pretty good idea of where we're headed. 
And that seems to be a better place overall. To read into the IZEA report for yourself, just head to IZEA.com, that's I-Z-E-A.com, and click on the Resources tab. What's your take on the latest numbers on the influencer pay gap? Is my injection of supply and demand economics problematic for you? I'd love to hear from you. Record a voice memo with your take and send it via email, or just send a regular email to jason at jasonfalls.com. I may use your comment on a future episode. Have a question or topic related to influence or influence marketing you'd like my take on? Inspire an episode by emailing me at that same address, jason at jasonfalls.com. I may use your question as a show topic. If I do, I'll send you a signed copy of Winfluence the book as a thank you. Winfluence, the influence marketing podcast, is presented by my book, Winfluence, reframing influencer marketing to ignite your brand. Get your copy online at winfluencebook.com. While you're there, sign up for the latest ideas about influence marketing delivered in my monthly newsletter or book me to speak to your company or organization about influence marketing. If you or someone you know is an influencer, a brand manager that uses influence marketing, or one of the many amazing people working in the influence marketing services world, and they would make a good guest for the show, email me at jason at jasonfalls.com. Our theme music is One More Look by the K-Club and Grammy Award-winning producer Jaquire King. Thanks for listening, and remember, when it's not about the person, but about results, it's Winfluence. This is a great show. I know. We've really got some competition out there. Hello there, podcast listener. Hey, if you want another great show to listen to that tackles hot topics in marketing, social media, public relations, and corporate communication, well, then we'd love it if you added Hanson and Hunt to your list of favorite podcasts. I'm Eric Hanson. And I'm Kevin Hunt. And we are Hanson and Hunt. And just like this show, we are part of the Marketing Podcast Network. So check us out sometime. Hanson and Hunt, available on your favorite podcast app. This podcast is heard along the Marketing Podcast Network. For more great marketing podcasts, visit marketing.com.